Uh, good morning. My name is Michael Semler, and I'm pleased to welcome you this morning to uh, our panel entitled uh, Community Colleges and Public Libraries 20 Years Later. And I'm pleased to present to you the panel members. Uh, to my immediate right is Martha Romero, who is the president of a college at the Siskiyous. Um, traveled down from up in that part of the world in Weed. Uh, next to her is Starrett, uh, Ms. Starrett Kreisman, who is the county librarian from Stanislaus County. To my immediate left is David Wolf, who is the executive director of the Accrediting Commission for the, Calif uh, for the Community and Junior Colleges. Uh, fourth panelist, Linda Wood, the county librarian from Alameda County, is unable to attend because of illness. Um, we'd like to talk a little bit today about libraries and community colleges. They both deal with education or literacy, but they have uh, both have experienced Proposition 13 from different perspectives. We hear from both of the of advocates of both organizations that they have sub suffered substantially from, the, from Proposition 13 or from the consequences of Prop 13, but really, have they really or have they simply adapted in different ways? Perhaps we could postulate that uh, uh, one has succeeded to some degree and one has failed. At least I'd like to postulate that. Um, that is to say the community colleges have, have a the question have, is which is which. Right. <laughs> right. No, I, I think, I don't think I th success and failure. Success and failure may be too strong, but, but, but one has adapted and one has certainly uh, have had an uphill more of an uphill uh, battle. Community colleges have been willing, to, willing in some respect to succeed some of their authority and certainly lots of their money to Sacramento. Uh, perhaps by changing their mission, perhaps by obtaining funds from, from state legislature, um, and perhaps by the fortunate confluence of that their faculty join with the faculty of the public K through 12 education system to join and obtain funds through the Prop 98 vehicle of funding so that they have remained uh, s somewhat solvent. It's also the case that they've been able to adapt by s serving a different kind of constituency and the changing in welfare reform perhaps has made some ch changes in that. We'll hear a little bit about that. Um, in contrast, the libraries, I would, po I would argue, and some would certainly disagree, have generally uh, been, have had a much harder time to overcome Proposition 13. Uh, they have su suffered significantly, principally because they were county librarians, county libraries, um, and the public has said, as we've discussed and before, that while we like libraries, we want them to continue, we want public safety to take the paramount share of, of city and, lo and local and county funds. Um, even before libraries, recreation, and park uses. Uh, so, the, and when the economy turns south or downward, libraries even suffer even, even in a greater form than anywhere else. Uh, some of the libraries have been able to survive uh, because they've been able to secure a strong financial base. They've sought funding through special taxes or assessment districts. Um, and up, even up to 15 years. But that process has meant that libraries which haven't been able to secure those funding sources are now in a secondary position. Uh, sometimes libraries have been able to co-opt or obtain through the citizen initiative process or through the cooperation of the local boards of supervisors a, a defined share of the local general tax. Um, but what's left it's a whole group of libraries which are been perhaps we can call the have-nots. Um, indeed, what, what libraries have now have to confront is a definition of what's their mission, what's their obligation, where are they going, what's a public library. Is the public library a community center, the symbol of the community, a building, or is it, or is it the contents there with, within it? Um, is, is, it uh, is the public library a place that you and I go to, 
or is it the place that we go to because we can't get a book at Barnes & Noble or Bar Borders or the local chain store or even the small bookstore? In fact, some people have argued that the Barnes & Nobles of the world and Borders have become the de facto libraries of America. Um, and the other question is, should it remain free? Or what's the definition of free in this system? Clearly, libraries and community colleges have to deal with a, uh, an amalgam of, of, ob of objectives and a changing mission, a changing of set of object, uh, goals. And they're dealing with those issues uh, head on. T today, we'd like to talk a little bit about some of those concerns. And I'd like to uh, start with the community colleges and, and leave the, the uh, library, library question second. So Martha, would you like to start? Good morning. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of an interesting issue because we, uh, we have gotten so accustomed to working in the environment that we work that it, uh, it takes some time to sit back and think about the result of Proposition 13. Initially, it was perceived as a proposition that would severely impact funding. And while it, in fact, has done that, um, I think the, the longer-term effect of Prop 13 has really been uh, in, the, in the world of, of policy. And I want to talk about two policy elements that I think have been severely impacted by um, Prop 13. The first one has to do with governance. Um, Prop 13, and it's interesting, the uh, Citizens Commission identifies that in the eight years following the um, approval of Proposition 13, there were 1,750 pieces of legislation that were initiated to regulate community colleges. So our policy world just mushroomed in terms of regu uh, regulation. The community colleges stopped being local institutions. Uh, before uh, Prop 13, they could have raise funds uh, for special needs. They could raise funds for buildings or for equipment or for new programs. With the advent of Proposition uh, 13, they were no longer able to do that. Uh, they could pass a bond measure with a two-thirds majority, but as you know, that benchmark is very difficult to reach. Uh, but in addition, their funding for other needs came through the state, and so they quit being local institutions in that sense. Prior to Proposition 13, community colleges had served primarily the constituency of their service areas. With the advent of Proposition 13, those borders were opened and community colleges could serve any student um, from any uh, part of the state. Now, <coughs> from, the, from the standpoint of the student, that was a clear advantage. They could vote with their feet. They could go to those institutions where they thought the program was more relevant to, to meet their needs. Um, from the standpoint of the uh, institutions, it, was, um, it put them in a very competitive environment. And it has taken quite a number of years for us to learn how to partner and how to identify priorities <coughs> and regionalize our priorities. So that was a change in terms of the service of a local constituency. Institutional boards continue to be required uh, to sign contracts, although they could no longer generate the funds to uh, support those contracts. Probably the greatest example is in the area of collective bargaining, uh, where once they could raise a tax levy to support uh, some contract that they uh, agreed to with their unions, in the, with the advent of Proposition 13, that was, they, they still were required to bargain locally, but the money now came from the state. And um, so they were sometimes in positions where they were agreeing uh, to contracts that they could no longer directly fund. That was another place where governance was severely impacted by Proposition 13. Proposition 13 also gave the legislature enormous authority to micromanage the districts. Um, they, for example, set regulations on collective bargaining. Uh, <clears throat> in recent years, the legislature has passed um, a shared governance po uh, policy, difficult to hear, thank you, has passed a uh, shared uh, governance policy that has um, made it quite difficult 
for local institutions to determine how they work together. We have spent probably eight or nine years trying to define what it was intended by the statute and where authority was given and how much authority was given to different segments of the institution. And that has created energy taken away from our fundamental mission, which is to educate students. The legislature sets fees for us at this point. And we are in an environment where we are in a boom or bust um, environment quite often. So we have dealt, for example, in the past several years with issues like uh, the differential fee, which at one point the legislature said anybody who has acquired a bachelor's degree should now be able to bear more of the cost of their education. So anyone who has a bachelor's degree will now pay $50 a credit hour as opposed to 13 hours a credit hour for anyone who has not uh, received a bachelor's degree. That, what that did was it created classrooms where somebody was sitting next to another person and they were paying a very different fee regardless of what the circumstances were in their life. They might have been in that environment, for example, to retrain for new jobs. They might have been in that environment to pick up some skills that they had not had to have before, but now we're in a job where they needed that. But there was a strict differential about, you, know, you could be in the same calculus class and one of you was paying $13 a credit hour and the other one of you was paying $50 a credit hour. In more recent times, this year, for example, uh, there is a movement in the legislature to reduce fees from $13 to $12. Now, while $1 for in a student's pocket doesn't make a whole lot of difference, in the state, uh, from a state perspective, it can generate or defund a tremendous number of initiatives. Um, and that is, is predicated on the notion that the, the economy is good, and therefore we can reduce fees by $1. It does not allow for the fact that uh, leaner times will again come, and we will be in a situation where we will have to raise funds at a time when people are least able to pay for those funds. So that's another instance where the, where the legislature has become uh, a micromanager of local districts. Probably one of the more interesting places uh, where the impact of proposition has been felt is in the, in, in the area of access. Um, the legislature now has the capacity to limit or set restrictions on how money is used. And we have a tremendous number of categorical programs that in some years are very generously funded, whether a district needs it or not, whether the student base is there to support it or not. Some of our categorical programs get good funding in some years and not so good funding in other years. In addition to that, the legislature is able to fund or defund growth. So in years when growth is funded, and it's always funded after the fact, so you have already served the students before you get the money to support those students that you have served, um, the legislature in some years will fund growth in the community college budgets. In other years, it will not fund growth. So there's, a, there's an up and down in our, in our budgeting process regarding, uh, regarding growth. The legislature also, um, created the capacity to set caps on institutions with high growth. So in a district like mine, for example, where our population base does not change very much, uh, creating 100 new FTEs in a year when growth is funded might or might not be achievable. But in areas in metropolitan districts where growth can be a runaway factor, where you might have 200, 300, 400 new students in any given um, academic year. They are limited to the amount, the number of new students that the legislature will fund. So in essence, they are, fund they are educating those students without adequate funding. So those are, I think, the, the, the greatest areas of impact on the community colleges. They are not directly funded, uh, they are not directly related to fiscal policy, but in fact they have a tremendous fiscal impact in terms of how uh, governance issues have generated that have created um, a disjuncture between the intent of local community colleges to serve their local population, to be governed by local boards, and the ability to fund 
uh, and generate the needed resources to support those services. Thank you. I'm going to turn to David Wolf, who is the responsible person for the accreditation of the community colleges. Thank you, Michael. And I think it'd be uh, only wise and appropriate before uh, making any comment to recognize a couple of uh, uh, very significant people in the room who probably know more about uh, many of these issues than I do. Certainly, uh, you should be aware that Peter Schrag is with us and uh, the best, uh, perhaps, overall sense of how California is changing and certainly Prop 13 figures significantly in his analysis of, um, of this state over the last 20 years uh, is found in this fantastic book, which I used as uh, deep background, I guess, for, uh, for this. So, uh, I want to recognize uh, Peter's uh, presence and also Michael Kurz from Stanford University who was had the honor of uh, sitting at his knee for a number of years in the graduate program there and I'm uh, uh, most pleased that Michael is here as well. Uh, I have used uh, the work of a number of people to try to prepare uh, uh, some reasonable observations for you today. Uh, Jerry Hayward, the former chancellor of California Community Colleges, uh, wrote, I thought, a rather penetrating article in the mid-80s. He introduced that, uh, that piece uh, with a citation from uh, Paul Valere. The problem with our times is that the future isn't what it used to be. And that characterizes, I think, very much um, the overall flavor of the impact of a Prop 13 over a over the decades uh, since its passage. Um, we can point to three major areas, and, and Martha's already uh, noted two of them in some detail, that have impacted California's community colleges. Uh, certainly the impact on finance, uh, the impact on the college mission, uh, and certainly the impact on college governance. I'd like to uh, hit those in that order. Uh, after all, the intent of Prop 13 was, in fact, to impact the way in which uh, certain public services were financed in the state of California. Now, the degree to which that was true for the community colleges is dramatized pretty well on this display here. The concepts here are uh, just a little bit complex. Let me make sure they're clear here. What this is tracking between 1965 and the most recent data we can get, which was, I believe, 96, uh, is the portion of the tax base in California that's devoted to its community colleges. That tax base has two major components, the property tax and the uh, personal income tax. Uh, what you see, and perhaps I can stand up to demonstrate it, With the passage of Prop 13, the composite of these two sources, total revenue, of the proportion of taxes that go to community colleges, the, they're, they're, the total of this drops precipitously with the passage of Prop 13 in 1978, and then continues to decline at a slower rate uh, through the 80s, and only in the last couple of years has there been even a turn back in the positive direction. You'll notice that while property tax, the pro proportion of property taxes devoted to community colleges really plummets. Here from a very uh, all-time highs in the mid-70s to, uh, well, almost nothing at the present time. Uh, you'll also notice that the portion coming from state income taxes uh, is flat and weak as well. The question could be asked, well, but how are the other sectors doing? Other educational sectors, or for that matter, 
non-educational sectors. The data I have don't answer the question quite as directly as we might like. That is, focus on the area, uh, on the time span from, say, the late or mid to late 70s through, say, the mid 80s. The only data I could find are these, but the, they indicate uh, a fairly consistent story. Between 1975 and 1985, excuse me, 95, the proportion, excuse me, the total revenues that were going to California's community colleges increase. But as you can see, at a rate, if we look at this last column, uh, far lower than uh, virtually anything you'd wish to compare it to, uh, whether it's the University of California, uh, the State University, uh, K-12, uh, general state funds in total, or the increase in revenues reported by private California corporations. Similarly, we can ask how does the pattern we've just seen for California compare to other states? Here we have some national averages for various periods where California uh, expenditures per full-time equivalent student in a community college uh, is compared. You can see that the rate of increases in this expenditure in California lag behind those elsewhere in the nation and therefore and that the ratio that is the comparative amounts spent in California are dropping. Um, there is something not apparent in these statistics about which you should be as, uh, aware as well. 10% uh, of all the students in a community college in California, uh, excuse me, 10% of all community college students in the nation are attending California community colleges. Uh, because of that fact, the low uh, expenditure per student that you see in California radically impacts that total national average. And that is, uh, uh, if you were to adjust for that effect, uh, these numbers here would be even more extreme. Martha talked about the impact of Prop 13 on students served in California, and this, I guess, is the real bottom line. <coughs> and this sad display uh, dramatizes what Prop 13 did in that regard. This uh, displays the so-called participation rate of uh, students in California community colleges. What this is is the proportion of the adult population that is enrolled at a community college by year. Uh, previous to Prop 13, that participation rate peaked at 88 persons per thousand. It has now dropped into the below 60 persons per thousand uh, uh, level uh, and has just only turned up in the last uh, few years from, from this nadir. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, a cause for some extraordinary concern uh, when one tries to defend the traditional role of community colleges in supporting the economy uh, and uh, local communities. Now, this drop in service 
uh, of course, came at a time when the demographics of the state were changing. Uh, this display compares 1977, just prior to the passage of the proposition, uh, and the latest data that we uh, that I could find, which shows the uh, splits uh, by gender and by ethnicity. And uh, there are some interesting patterns in here. We can come back to this later if you really would like to explore it in, in detail. But uh, whereas women are being relatively uh, better served, uh, for the most part, in every category on the male side, the participa rate, participation rates are down. And uh, for some of the female uh, minority groups, uh, they're down as well. In effect, the mission of the colleges was impacted simply by the wherewithal that was transmitted to them. It's no surprise that when you have to make cuts, you make cuts that impact the harder to serve student, not the easier to serve one. Um, as well, there was some overt mission alteration. Martha mentioned the increased participation in local community college affairs by the state legislature. This included uh, first a $30 million reduction statewide in 1982 of California community college apportionments directly, just directly aimed at certain kinds of course offerings. Um, that was followed then in 1988 with a reform bill which uh, specifically delineated those priorities that the California community colleges statewide uh, would undertake. Again, uh, if not eliminating, certainly reducing the impact of the local community's ability to decide these matters. Uh, just a word about governance. I think Martha has uh, discussed that point extremely well. Um, a quote from Jerry Hayward, the irrepressible Howard Jarvis argued for the passage of Prop 13 by saying it was time to remove decisions from those popcorn balls in Sacramento. A cruel irony for Mr. Jarvis and the proponents of Prop 13 is that, quote, those popcorn balls, unquote, more effectively control the major funding decisions for local governments, including community colleges today. Um, I, I think that summarizes it well. Uh, in 1995, uh, Berman and Weiler, who did a very comprehensive review of the state of California's community colleges, concluded, quote, both local trustees and the state board of governors lack key elements of the capacity to govern. As a consequence, key decisions affecting the colleges are often made by the state legislature, that is, in the political arena. Uh, again, I think that well summarizes uh, both the state of things in 1985 and, I don't know, Martha, it would be my conclusion, that probably what pretty well summarizes uh, the state of things today. There's a tremendous irony here that the community college, uh, born and bred to serve the specific needs of the locale, uh, find themselves, uh, for the most part today, uh, trying to respond to uh, state level uh, uh, mandates, uh, many of which uh, bear no particular meaning for the for the community they are located within. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, transferring our focus a little bit to the li to another question of literacy and training education, and that is the county library. Starrett. Good morning. Uh, our moderator raised a lot of questions about current issues in libraries, and I'll, I'll try to get to some of those perhaps later. Uh, remind me about Barnes & Noble and Mission. 
uh, as I was looking through some of our materials, uh, Proposition 13, some unintended consequences, I noticed that the author didn't mention libraries under the county expenditures, where he showed the decline in expenditures for some categories. He showed libraries under cities. And I think there's very little understanding of the fact that counties do run libraries. This is, again, a, you know, a governance issue. Uh, I represent um, a group of libraries that are called general fund libraries. We get all our funding from the county general fund, um, nowhere else. We have no dedicated income of our own. And this is an historical situation. Most of the bigger city libraries or uh, bigger counties have, have dedicated income of some variety. But those that were rural and small of prior to Prop 13 or around Prop 13 were pretty much stuck with being general fund libraries. There's a, another wonderful quote from, from Howard Jarvis in here. Um, because 63% of public school graduates are illiterate anyway, they would have little use for libraries. And I thought, well, he didn't get that, that figure from a library. Um, I have another favorite Howard Jarvis quote, um, which I think of often, and that is, uh, if you shot a cannon through most libraries, you wouldn't hit anybody. And I often think of that one as I look around my library and calculate the number of ambulances we would need uh, to haul off the wounded if this, in fact, did happen. I, I, he didn't get that quote in the library either. After Proposition 13 hit in, in my county, uh, the library director then, this is several directors ago, immediately closed six libraries, six branch libraries. So we lost something immediately. We lost some access points. We lost a lot of square footage. The library then uh, went into a, d a decline for many, for many years uh, as the, the county monies dried up. In 1984, we laid off half our staff. In 1982, after the ERAF shift uh, took even more money from the counties in the way of, of property tax, the library lost money again. The previous uh, layoff was caused because someone noticed that the county deficit was exactly the amount of the library budget. Voila, an answer. Uh, but I, I don't want to say cooler heads. Some heads prevailed, and only half the library budget was taken at that time. Libraries are not a mandated service. Uh, they're totally at, at the mercy of local funding sources, though I think, again, that this is very poorly understood. As we were going through our, our second layoff, uh, a gentleman asked me, uh, you know, why was this happening? Uh, weren't public libraries totally funded by the federal government? They were, they were so necessary. Didn't, didn't the feds, you know, provide funding for every public library in the county? Uh, everywhere, and I had to tell him that no, you know, it's it's local money. It's it's your money locally, and that's that's what we're looking at. Uh, in response, uh, this is way down the road from Prop 13, but we have to you know look at at what's happened since then. Certainly, the ERAF shift uh, is is related to Prop 13. Merced, Shasta, and Lassen counties have have virtually closed their county libraries, and these are counties like mine, where there aren't city libraries. There are no city libraries, um, no cities that run their own libraries. The situation is different in, in many other counties and in many places in the state. And this is one thing that you know, confuses uh, the issue of governance and funding and also leads to the haves and have not situation, which was mentioned by our moderator. Our, I am lucky enough um, to be in a county which devised a local solution. Our, our, we were, it's local, uh, it took a lot of hard work. We are funded, and our, we're the first county library in California to be funded by a local sales tax. We, this took special legislation. It's a one-eighth cent sales tax, which now is used by some other libraries, but at the time that we tried this in, in 1995, uh, we alone were, were attempting to use it. And not only did we have to have you know, special legislation, but then we had to have the election and win by the two-thirds supermajority. And we did. Um, we did all of those things. And I'm, I'm from uh, the Central Valley, which people have now heard of. It used to be I would tell people where I was from, and they would just look at me. But um, the Valley has uh, attained some, some, some prominence and notice in the state of California. And, but the Valley uh, continues to have the same demographics, uh, even in the face of people knowing where we are. Uh, we have very, very low educational attainment. Um, comparable 
money. You know, people don't make who don't have a lot of education don't tend to make a lot of money. So we have you know have very very low. Um, demographics in, in a, lot, a lot of areas. So this was looked on as generally as a miracle um, that we were able to pass such a library measure in, in such a place. Uh, our library is very, very heavily used uh, and con you know, continues to be since we reopened our doors. Uh, we have had you know, just an immense upswing in use and that's, that's part of the, the answer to the, the Barnes and Noble question which I do want to look at a little, in a little more detail. Uh, where we are 20 years later, however, um, we have fewer books than we should have, definitely. We went through more than 10 years of, of absolutely lousy funding, so our book collections are, are not where they should be. This is not something you can uh, bring back miraculously in a year or two of great funding. We have less square footage than we had um, at the beginning. As I said, some outlets were closed immediately, and even though we have opened some new libraries since then, they tend to be smaller. In the, in the meantime, our population has grown hugely, so there are more people wanting to use libraries and cramming in to uh, this number of outlets. Our collection's grown only 32 percent over 20 years. That's, that's a very small number. And that may be a function of lack of space as well as, as lack of money. Uh, we don't have the, the space to, to cram all those, those books that we need for that burgeoning population. We're doing other things, too. Um, we need square footage for all the, the computer terminals and workstations that we've installed. One other statistic I noticed that was interesting to me in looking back and comparing 1978 and 1998 is that our circulation of books per capita has gone down. Now, there may be a lot of other factors involved here. Um, certainly, you know, the demographics is one of them. Uh, the other competing, other competing uh, factors for people's attention, we all hear about this continually, uh, that reading is only one thing people do. They also, you know, use computers, they watch movies, they watch television, they do all kinds of recreation and sports. Uh, so there may, there may be other things going on there, as well as the fact that libraries are now uh, supplying some of these things. We have a huge usage of our public internet access stations, for instance. So I know that people are coming in um, to use that. They may be coming in to ask a question or attend a program. They may not be checking out as many books as they used to. But in absolute terms, we are checking out fewer books than we used to, even though um, all of our measures, uh, you know, of measuring our, our, our use have climbed. We've seen only 27% um, growth in, uh, in our circulation, while our population in our county, and I think this is typical of the valley, has grown almost 70 percent. We've had just enormous population growth. The funding, um, I, I don't know the formula for adjusting from 1978 dollars, although I, I suspect that we're probably just holding steady. Again, in absolute terms, we have, we have more money per capita than we had in 1978, thanks to the one eighth cent sales tax, which brings in millions of dollars for the library. But uh, I suspect that we're probably just holding our own. And in terms of that increased population that I spoke of, we definitely have less money than we did then. Uh, I can't help but think that a lot of this has been, has been detrimental, um, lack of access to information but I, and, and education that's occurred over, over these years. I also think, and I, I'd like to comment on this, that, that Prop 13 changed people's relationship to government. Uh, before Prop 13, as, as I mentioned, I think there was very, as particularly in libraries, there was very little understanding, uh, you know, that libraries were even part of government. Um, we, you know, people didn't know where our funding came from and didn't really care as long as the doors were open. I heard many times after Prop 13 passed and library cutbacks started to be visible, people were apologizing. They came in and apologized to the staff. They said, we're so sorry. I voted yes, but I didn't mean you. I didn't want any cutbacks in the library. I, I'm devastated. There's no story time for my children. I can't get in anymore. Um, over time, those attitudes hardened. And we heard more of uh, the questions brought up by our moderator. Why don't you do more with less? Why don't you combine with the schools, charge for cards, run it like a business, um, you know, do, do anything. Uh, run it with volunteers. This is, this is another common one. But that, that sympathy uh, definitely, definitely disappeared. So, you know, in conclusion for my library, and I'm going to comment on, on Linda Woods, who isn't here, um, people where I live are happy, but only because we have a, a unique situation where we are well-funded and we are well-used, and it's very, very visible. 
uh, we have been able to provide what our, our community, our customers said they wanted. A lot of other county libraries and, and typically the general fund libraries are in dire straits still. Now, Linda Wood, who couldn't be here today, um, comes from a district library. They get property tax money of their own. So they were not impacted so much by Prop 13 as by subsequent events. It was the ERAF shift in 1992 that really put the district libraries on the ropes. Uh, Linda mentioned to me now that this group of libraries is extremely interested not in some of the other solutions that I've explored, but in getting that ERAF money back from the state. That's where their, their lobbying, their focus really is, is on some of the bill's legislative remedies to get that ERAF money back. She also mentioned, um, as a consequence, the powerlessness that her local people feel, library supporters. And this has been mentioned again and again, that the shift from local funding to dependence on the state, the necessity to lobby the state and the lack of ability that local policymakers have to do something about the problems. So this is an impact that libraries are feeling as well as the community colleges and others. Now, do you want me to address some of the things you, you brought well, up? You, you, or, you, or wait? Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait okay. Wait. Um, thank you very much for doing this. I would like to have a chance for the audience to, to sure. have, ask, yeah, get a hand at it. Perhaps or a date. No. I, I think that, that uh, but it's clear one of the impacts that you just so eloquently stated is the powerlessness that the local communities feel to deal with uh, questions that, of a service that they wish to have, whether it's education or literacy, or that they somehow or another have succeeded their powers and authority to somewhere else. And they don't have the capacity to change what they want, other than initiating revenue generating programs at the local level. Um, my comments earlier were directed to the fact that the community colleges have been able to survive in some respects because they were able to get some revenues, dedicated source, from the state, at least at some, some portion of it, whereas the, the, the libraries have had this revenue taken away from them. The, the, the temporary, which becomes permanent, revenue shift uh, to, from, from the counties to other, other services back to the state. Um, and counties don't charge people coming through the door. The county libraries don't charge people coming through the door. Whereas community colleges charge people coming through the door. That was a shift. It used to be free. Now it's no longer free. But they have a, a gatekeeping kind of activity. Whereas the libraries don't have that luxury. Um, and so they have to look for something else. Or, as I alluded to, Maybe they need to rethink their direction and goal, which, of course, any librarian would not like at all. But nevertheless, I'd like to see if anyone has any comments or questions from the audience. Sir, yeah, I'm, I'm going to repeat the question for those of you in the back. I would agree with you that uh, libraries haven't done well, although I really don't think our community colleges have done very well either. Uh, even as our funding has gone down, which you have to present it, we have to look at what have been the needs of the community colleges since the passage of Proposition uh, 13. One, we have a whole new set of needs that didn't exist then. Many of our students today come with a very limited English background, speaking ability, and what have you. That has to be addressed in our community colleges, and it's a real need that we didn't have before that is, I think it's fair to say, certainly increased over the past 20 years and probably even increased in the future we see it today. Another problem we begin to face is the lesser preparation of our students from the high school. Statistics are fairly clear on this, that California's education is still gone down from one, number one, to number 52 on a scale of one to 50. <laughs> they actually put Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands above uh, California in certain regards. Uh, this is really true. So we see that we now have a greater need today than we had before. Three, the changes over the past 20 years in advanced technology and the need for information. Uh, I teach at the California Community College, and um, prior to teaching there, I uh, interviewed another physician in a different state. He offered me, he said, make a wish list of all the computers you want. Uh, just whatever you want, and we'll more or less apply. Obviously, I didn't 
<laughs> and then I was uh, at a community college, and he showed me an old typewriter. I think it's 50 years old. And as of this point, I've had to pay for everything myself. I think they bought me an inkjet ribbon. Uh, what we begin, <laughs> what we begin to see is a lot has changed in the last 20 years in terms of technology, which really puts a real demand and a financial demand upon our entire institution, including those of our teachers and those of our students. Another fact we begin to see today we didn't see 20 years ago is the extremely broad range of students that we get in our classroom. Right now I have a one small class who actually has a student with a BA degree from uh, one of the European institutions, very, very good. Right next to that seems to be several students maybe functioning at the 10th grade or less. And how do you really deal with this kind of a, a, a disparity in level of preparation and what have you? I do believe it's probably fair to say that this has certainly increased over the last 20 years. Uh, and speaking of libraries, we ought to really look at the libraries in our community colleges. Uh, some of them are far, far from adequate. And yet, uh, sort of my irony is that that really should be the brain of the institution. And we really need good libraries in our community colleges. And I can certainly say that uh, many of them do not have it. So in summing it up, I'm saying even though the funding has gone down, all these other factors have taken place over the 20, past 20 years that put increased demands upon the community college. And we may be alive, but we're certainly not well. And uh, that needs to be stated. Mar Martha, do you want to respond? I think you're absolutely right. I think um, eloquent I, statement. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, I would only add that uh, the uh, largesse of California now buoyed by the recent boom uh, is reflecting itself in increased funding for California community colleges. Uh, nothing seems to be simple when you're dealing with the political forces that uh, you know you've heard described here. Um, and so the uh, hundred million dollars that the base for community colleges in California is being increased in 1998-99 uh, comes with new notions uh, about linking this money to ultimately anyway to certain kind of performance indices. Uh, again we can argue whether that's good or bad but the uh, again the, the main point is that uh, there was very little opportunity for the local colleges to, to be effective participants, at least from my vantage point, uh, in the shaping of the way this, uh, this new money now is coming, uh, coming to the colleges. Uh, you know, your points are very well taken. Uh, the number of people who uh, would like to have community college access has increased tremendously over the last 20 years, and the forecast, as you know, with Tidal Wave 2 and all this, uh, uh, doesn't make it look any easier. Uh, the participation rates, as we noted, are now running uh, the lowest they have run in recent history. And if there is not significant uh, increase in access to community colleges, if in fact the profile of persons interested in access uh, plays out as most of the forecasts now predict, that participation rate is going to decline. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I won't make a judgment here. I'll ask you, is that, you know, the kind of, of state you want to live in? Is that good public policy at the state level? Martha, Martha just wanted to add Yeah, one. I think one of the things that uh, directly relates to, um, to the uh, concepts that you um, summarized for us in terms of additional needs and, and new needs uh, for our community colleges is a fact that relates directly to Proposition 13 and the fact that uh, funding levels per student were frozen at 1978 levels as a result of Proposition 13. And as a result, those districts, that poorer districts, but also districts that had been fairly conservative in how they used their tax base, were frozen at that point in time, and that becomes the base from which new budgets are generated. So the result has been an uneven um, funding for community colleges and in fact those colleges that had been the most 
parsimonious in how they assigned uh, tax revenues or how they taxed themselves were at a tremendous disadvantage after 1978 and continue to be. So when you hear us lobbying for, fa for funds called equalization funds, that is an effort to raise the standards of funding per student for those poor districts and for those districts that were for particularly conservative in their use of funding prior to Proposition 13 to raise them to some standard um, and it's 50 percent, 52 percent is all that that equalization will bring that district to of, of the funding that is enjoyed by those districts that were more generous in their uh, distribution of tax money. So that, that continues to be an inequity and it continues to be even though we, we continue to get more and more directives about the people that we will serve and how we will serve them and what we will do with remediation and <clears throat> what's the state of technology that our institutions uh, need to be able to conform to, there are in fact many districts in the system for who, who do not yet enjoy even 52% of the stand, state standard that is set for funding per student. Thank you. Sir. Yes, Mike. This, this is uh, kind of depressing. It's a tough way to begin a Friday. Uh, I guess my question is for all members of the panelists. I'd like you all to try really hard and think of any possible benefits that this proposition has brought about within libraries and the community college. I know it might be tough, but think well, really hard. Yeah, Maybe some perverse ways to get this happen. Or <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just love to hear Li you. Let's go to the libraries. Uh, I think, uh, you know, and, and definitely an attention to what we're doing. The word <laughs> the word mission was, was mentioned. Uh, you, you questioned mission, actually, but if you look at the web, the web is absolutely clogged with library home pages, all with lovely mission statements and goals and objectives. Uh, and I, I think we're paying a lot of, of attention to what we're doing. It's not just lip service. Um, certainly partnerships have been created. I know in my own uh, district we have many, many partnerships and we might not have looked outside ourselves if we had, you know, just all the wonderful funding that, that we needed. Um, I think there have been, you know, that, that in itself is one wonderful consequence. We're now involved uh, in many, many avenues. And it's hard to tell because 20 years, I mean, who knows sometimes what is a consequence of what and what would have happened, uh, you know. But uh, certainly I am involved in economic development efforts in, in my county. And I am not sure that that would have happened without Prop 13. And even though, as I said, we enjoy uh, a decent funding picture, um, we are doing many things differently because of all those lean years. Let me just amplify uh, what Sarah indicated. In many places in California, libraries uh, have suffered for the first 20 years. But I think they're emerging now uh, from a, this, um, a change. For a variety of reasons, they're changing. ERAF is forcing them to change. Uh, a variety of other issues have forced them to change. And they recognize that, in fact, at least some of these short-term financing opportunities are not, are not as successful over the, long, over the long term. So they are recognizing that they have, have to change. And as Sarah indicated, they recognize that they're effectively an in, essential in, uh, ingredient in the community. And the community is recognizing that they are an essential ingredient for an economic development strategy for growth programs. That they are providing resources to citizens um, that are not available elsewhere and um, could effectively they're, they are recasting themselves, some begrudgingly and some quite openly, to try to serve uh, com their communities. And the communities really love libraries. Communities love their, the libraries. The, the problem is they love them to death, in the sense they, are, they, they like the building, they like the place to go to, but they're not sure how to, how to access it. And it's not, it's, the librarians are now recognizing some of these problems and in fact from my tours are recognizing that they have to change and that I think has a positive consequence over this. The community colleges? Martha, you want to yes, I think um, one of the things that it has created is a, is a much more of an environment of entrepreneurialism. 
So we've become much scrappier institutions in terms of seeking funding from sources other than state than public money. Um, I think we have uh, developed a sense of partners of developing partnerships among our own institutions. Certainly for the students, as I noted earlier, the capacity to or the ability to go to any institution in their neighborhood or to any institution that they chose to drive to or otherwise commute to has been a positive for students. Um, but I think probably the sense that it has created for us of partnership among our own system and the development of a sense of system has probably been a good result. Uh, I would only uh, give a little, em a little bit of emphasis to what uh, Martha's mentioned that the biggest thing that comes to mind, and, and I want to put this back in context again. Um, yes, you can find some, uh, you can interpret some of the outfall from uh, what at least I interpret as largely Prop 13 induced change as positive. Um, but I think this begs major policy questions. I want, I want to make that clear. Having said that, uh, prior to Prop 13, most community colleges did not have significant foundations. That is, separate, semi-independent, uh, purely fundraising and fund uh, managing operations that uh, were devoted to the support of the college. But today, I believe there's not one community college in this state that not only doesn't have a foundation, but 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 where these foundations are active and uh, seeking uh, grant monies where where that was not typical prior to to, to prop uh, 13 uh, large scale uh, fundraising campaigns in their local communities uh, and where a number of uh, uh, fairly innovative uh, uh, fund seeking uh, exercises are, are underway everywhere uh, so there one could say it's a positive that the funding base in many cases of community colleges is more diversified today than it was prior to Prop 13, which in the long run is probably a good thing. Can, sure. I, can I add, I'm sorry, libraries also have formed foundations. I just wanted to, to say that. We, we have done the, done the same thing, looked outside and said, what else can we do? Um, but, some, you know, it, it's significant money sometimes, but... Uh, all of these are, are tough ways to, to fund public services. My question is for David Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was on my dissertation defense committee. I want you to know. Yes, Sorry. Uh, 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 hypothetically, there's a whole missing part of your analysis, which is you show declining participation rates. Right. There's no analysis of what's going on in the private or proprietary sector. Let me make an argument. They have been filling in behind the community colleges with new flexible programs. Mm -hmm. And that in the 21st century, there's a huge number of entrepreneurs entering this field. We have about 15 Stanford business students a year starting new education delivery companies. Mm -hmm. And that if you only look at participation rates in the public sector, you're missing what's going on in the private sector. And that the private sector is going to become even more nimble and profit seeking in this game in the future. And we just can't continue doing public analyses uh, a la 1978 when the private sector was a smaller factor. Now, I don't know whether any of that's true, but I'd like some discussion. You bet. Whether you ever do any analyses. Uh, in, indeed. The other face of this. Uh, let me put on uh, completely my accreditors hat here because the Western Association of Schools and Colleges accredits both public and private institutions. Uh, if you were to look, uh, j just an aside if I can, um, WASC is organized into two commissions, one that uh, accredits uh, the senior colleges and universities of California, Hawaii, and the far Pacific Islands, uh, and the commission uh, for which I work that does the two-year colleges. Uh, if you look at the senior college commission, you will see that of their approximately 140 member institutions, uh, something like 23 are public. Okay, so the private sector at the four-year and graduate level is clearly, at least in numerical terms, significant. If you look at the number of students served, obviously, it's a very different picture. But let's look now at the two-year landscape of our 138 
current members in that same geography, about 20 are private. So it's a very different landscape, Mike, depending on which uh, degree you are looking at, which is not to say that we should not um, factor in the impact of entrepreneurialism and uh, the private sector for uh, associate level and certificate training. Uh, let me make a quick comment on that. Um, and I'm going to take a more national perspective now than, than purely California, but California, it's, it's also true. Um, yesterday I was at the uh, American Community College trustee uh, convention in San Francisco and was uh, on a panel talking about the community college offering the baccalaureate degree. This is a very hot item in the public community college sector. It is so because community colleges are more widely spread typically than larger public four-year institutions. And many locales feel underserved at the baccalaureate level in certain service, um, in, in certain curriculum areas of service. There are businesses prepared to put money into the offering of programming at the baccalaureate level that's beneficial to them in their local community, which may be some distance from the nearest significant university. Uh, what I'm suggesting, Mike, is that the competition matrix is going to likely get far more complicated as we look uh, into the years ahead. And already existing institutions who may have a geographic advantage in some markets are going to find themselves, I suspect, uh, teaching in some different areas. One final dimension where we are going to see increased competition, and this is definitely going to impact the community college, but not quite the way in which I think many have forecast. And by the way, here DeVries is mentioned constantly in community college circles. Uh, is the marketing by public and private, but significantly public, community colleges of their services well beyond their traditional community? We have four colleges in California right now who are advertising nationally their distance education offerings. Uh, this, by the way, is motivated by post Prop 13 consequences. It's a revenue source. Now, this poses all kinds of problems, but, it, but it, it again, I think, addresses the point that Mike is raising. The participation rates in California could very well be impacted by institu public institutions, perhaps, in Illinois, or in Alabama, or in Alaska, or for that matter, in London. You should be aware that the Open University just incorporated in Delaware, that's a British distance education, primarily graduate school, uh, oriented in institution. So this whole mix of who's going to offer what is very much, uh, I think, up for grabs. And participation rates, I think, Mike, you're right, need to take a bigger view, perhaps. But at least for the community colleges, and I would say California, a good bit of the story is told by that graphic. Oh, sure. I, first of all, um, I would venture to say uh, that of the, if you've asked people at random, what have you, where have you been to recently, uh, they have said essentially uh, a bookstore or a library, they would be more likely to have been in a bookstore than in a library. In the bookstore, I'm using Barnes & Noble as an example, of course. Um, I'm not plugging or defaming them in any particular way, but maybe I am. But the, but but essentially, people, when you ask them, what, why did you go there? It's because I got, good, I got service. It's hard to believe sometimes, but I had service. There was some coffee. There were some easy chairs. The books were readily available. I liked the atmosphere of the place. And it's open, literally, seven days a week <coughs> till 10 o'clock at night. The public library doesn't have that. It has better trained librarians who are providing you assistance and who understand the issues, but you are un less likely to go there. And in fact, 
uh, families with young children are equally likely to, I suspect, to go to the Barnes and Noble for a children's hour at a, in, the, in their attempt to sell a book as they are to a, a li as, as they are to a, to a, 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 a local library. Uh, I mean, it'll often that's the case. And I'm just suggesting to you that the libraries are now having competition from the private market. I'm not, there's certainly advantages to one for the other, both, but the point is that the libraries are now in a competitive mode, similar to the community colleges. And the librarians are now beginning to recognize that. That's what I'm I think there's competition all over. I don't think it's just um, Barnes & Noble. Certainly um, in a country where shopping is listed in every survey I've seen as the main recreational activity, uh, many people are going to be more comfortable in a retail environment. That's all there is to it. However, uh, I think that there's a, a lot of cross-fertilization. I, I go to Barnes & Noble or whatever bookstores yeah, around. Right. I'm, I'm a library user and a, a bookstore user, and most, again, of the surveys I've seen reveal that people are, are both. Uh, people who use libraries tend to, tend to buy books. They're good customers of bookstores. Uh, I think there are lots of, of other things going on uh, as, as far as the relationship you know, between the two. Um, I, I would contend that we get, we get far more people for story times and, and things like you know, programs like that than Barnes and Noble and the other bookstores who have said, oh, this is a good way to get people in. We have hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people coming. And um, I have never been to a bookstore story time that was particularly well attended because I don't think they have the training. The, you know, the staff don't have the training. There's a lot more turnover in staff. And I don't think they pay, you know, pay attention to the same things that librarians do. During the time that we were uh, very poorly funded and not open, and I think that's a major factor, is open hours, uh, the bookstore, my friends at the bookstore, one of the bookstores in town, told me that they frequently had people calling just in an absolute panic, you know, screaming about, you know, can I, can you find me a, you know, a, a, a diagram of the bones of a giraffe, you know, or can you find me this? And they would say, you know, we don't do that. We don't do things like that. Uh, and again, um, one of my staff members was re recently out at a large bookstore, and she said someone, this panicky person just grabbed her and said, can you help me find a good reader? And she, they knew each other from, from the library, and she wasn't getting it, you know, the service she wanted. So the staff person sat her down and you know, said, well, you know, this is really good, and you know, what are you looking for, and, and found it for her. So I think that, that libraries are emphasizing customer service. Um, certainly we are in my library. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of cross-fertilization. There is some competition from, from all kinds of sectors, not, not just Barnes & Noble. But we, we are looking at that and, and working on what we do. Oh, I'm, I use the Barnes & Noble, but I can go after video warehouse video <laughs> store, video stores. I mean, you, you pick any example uh, that the libraries are recognizing they're in a competitive well, environment. Okay, as far as video stores go, um, we do recognize that, and we buy, by policy, the kinds of documentary and educational right. videotapes that video stores don't stock at all. And we do not compete with them, you know, as far as the latest, uh, you know, Bruce Willis or Sylvester Stallone movie goes. We never want to compete with them on that. But we have videotapes on, you know, how to present yourself when you go for a job interview, how to train a dog, how to lay a brick walkway. Right. Different market. Right. Uh, sir. <laughs> I, was, you know, I was wondering about, you know, yesterday they talked about the unintended consequences and uh, in looking at the impact on cities and counties, they did have to develop the entrepreneurial uh, attitude and they, they really got into that. I think on these two services there was more of a policy impact that hadn't been thought out than any other of the services impacted by Prop 13. I'm going to get to a question after you. That's fine. And, you know, when, when David was mentioning the mission, you know, I did a study, you know, 20 years ago on the impact on the mission of the community college. And if you look at, at that time, a mission that had been approved was no tuition, local control, comprehensiveness, and equality of access. You know, the community college league had approved that. Within 20 years, all four of those missions are gone. And we just heard about access on the participation rates. You. Uh, you charge fees, you identify that as a gatekeeper. The state had already been looking at ways to doing that in 75 under, under the governor. But, you know,
know, the other thing is, is with the gatekeeping that happens in libraries is the shutting down of the doors. The hours got shorter, right. so, you know, That's right. less access. So, you know, you have those impacts, the same impact, I think, on the mission of the library. And prior to 78, these were two tremendous treasures in our, in our state. You know, they did not have a cost. It was open. You could argue that it was one of the few truly taxpayer benefits in the state. It also gave us the state that we have today, or that we had then. Yesterday. We have given us the state today, too. No. So here's my question. Maybe what has happened is, is that the 20 years, if you look in retrospect, are we better off today than we would have been, having lost you know, the potential of the community college to continue at that participation rate, even modify the comprehensiveness probably would have been examined in the kinds of courses. I remember the debates over some of those kinds of courses. But, you know, the participation rate took out a whole slew of people. The minute you put in a fee, it's been shown any rate, any study across the nation, a tuition fee put in on any institution limits the kind of people who come. So you hope you stop the access. So are we better off? I would argue not, but I would like the panel to look at that. Second, another unintended consequence seems to be, you know, what Martha was talking about with the rural campuses, a redistribution of money. I come from Napa County. Now in Napa County, for all of a sudden, as we have become more popular, as our wine industry has improved our property tax rates, housing rates, our money leaves <coughs> our county and goes to the state now and may fund. It. So you have a redistribution. You could argue that's good, state rights, you know, and someone shared that with me yesterday. You could also argue that really hurts a rural district that maybe has tried to deal with their own problems. So I think, you know, you, you, looking at the panel, how do you see, how do we resolve the future? Is it salary tax, you know, uh, sales, tax. sales tax increases? Should the property tax that a, a district makes above the 1978 rate, should that stay with the local at this point in time? Because I don't think if we ever get back to some kind of local control, some kind of control of your own destiny, uh, will we ever really resolve some of the problems that have been created in our nation? Before I turn the panel over to the questions to the panelists, you're alluding to another issue, major issue, which is essentially um, as, these, as these programs and other programs become successful in managing their own future, are they in fact being penalized by the state yes. for their for their adequacy in responding to their own constituent needs. Martha? Well, I was interested in, in Michael Kirst's question to David because it seems to me that it, it makes some assumptions that I think are relevant to your, to your point. And that is, I think one of the unintended consequences of Proposition 38 is that it has made us incredibly mean-spirited and that the the notion of investment in our people has gone away. We do not see us as a public good. We do not see ourselves as needing to support the public good. Uh, we define the public good only in terms of how it impacts me or my household. We do not see it as how it impacts a people, um, a society, a state. That, I think, is probably the greatest impact for all of us. And it's related to your question, not only in terms of access, but in terms of how we work together uh, to meet the needs and to invest in a quality of life that's statewide. Uh, we appreciate. We do not want that to diminish. But on the other hand, we are very little willing to invest um, in that society and in maintaining that level of society. And so what in essence we have done, I believe, is we created a very public system that had very wide access. We are putting our own gates. We are making gated communities out of our community colleges by uh, our approach to policy. Elephant. Um, let me just um, uh, push, push this issue into the future a bit. Um, there is, uh, again, if one believes the uh, more common forecast now for the uh, demand for community college education that uh, several 
uh, economists have put forward. Uh, there will, over the next 20 years, be a requirement for half again as much capacity as there is today uh, in the two-year sector of California. Uh, is there anybody in this room that can imagine another 50 community colleges being constructed in the next? Why is it you can't imagine that? I think this gets to, to Martha's point completely. Because if we were sitting here in 1978, you could have imagined it. It wouldn't have been a big deal. Um, the number of community colleges, new community colleges, public ones, uh, created in the state since 1968, I believe number two. I hope I'm dramatizing what this really means. I mean, uh, th this, this is fundamental policy prior to 1978 uh, in California. And I'm not saying this were to, you know, should have been continued forever, but um, the creation of a new commun community college was not a real big thing because it's what state policymakers believed was appropriate for a fast-growing state. Well, the state's growing fast again, uh, but there will not be the will. Uh, that's quite clear to create these. So what will happen? Um, that, that's, that's the question. And um, I, I want to again reinforce uh, my friend Martha Romero's point. If it is in the public interest to limit your vision to that which immediately benefits you and your family, uh, then th then I'm, I'm not too comfortable about what uh, uh, this uh, tidal wave is going to bring. But uh, if, on the other hand, we can be innovative and uh, perhaps take that wider view of what community means, I think, I think the community college can be a tremendous lever to, uh, to respond to a lot of needs that will be beneficial for the state. Thank you. Uh, no, I could only echo what yeah, so. perhaps, David, you could explain uh, on one of your charts you had shown just a small rise in the enrollment and funding for, for students or for people. Uh, mm -hmm. could you, I mean, I, I would imagine it's probably a better economy that's, that's affecting that, but perhaps you could explain that little increase and where do you see that going or how it might continue to increase for the community college? Uh, you have to re-examine. Uh, There's a tick up here in both the participation rates that we looked at. This is the display that I find so important. Um, and if you look at the proportion of state taxes that are going to the community college, that too in, in just the, the most recent years has ticked up a little. And, and uh, some data that's not on here because we don't have it precisely yet, uh, will uh, also demonstrate uh, continuation of this modest increase. Uh, this is obviously uh, relatively good news. But all this has to be taken in context, I believe, because if we don't look at what we used to consider the norm, no matter which way you look at it, we don't understand what a wholesale change took place with Prop 13, which, which is, after all, the topic here. What was the impact of Prop 13? Um, if we began to talk about, I want to make this very clear, serving the people of California at the rate they were served in 1977, we're talking about community colleges now, and if the tidal wave comes about as forecast, we're not just talking about half again as many students. We have to add in now another quarter to get from 0.6 to 0.88. Am I making sense now? We're not only serving a larger population, we're serving a larger proportion of that population than we are currently. But we're just getting back to where we were in 1977. And there were some in 77 who argued 
88 per thousand wasn't enough. That, that isn't really doing the job. That isn't fulfilling the mission. But we aren't doing as well as we have. That's the main point I want on either of these counts. Um, I want to thank you for uh, coming today uh, to join us. Uh, I started out this panel by alluding to the fact that Proposition 13 has had some interesting consequences for two segments of the uh, of our local arena, the community colleges and the live public libraries, and suggested that perhaps community colleges were able to be successful and the libraries until recently have not been successful in meeting the challenges of Prop 13. In fact, perhaps they've both been um, successful but in different ways, or perhaps they're both need have undergoing significant changes that we as a society are just now beginning to recognize that have profound uh, long-term consequences upon California and upon the population and uh, the changing population of California. Again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.